tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We have to have the same common purpose to attacking climate change that we have had to attacking COVID-19. A new climate plan for BC, making it more expensive for you to pollute also. We believe Jeffrey Lee was abducted by force. New surveillance video and details about a kidnapping on Vancouver's west side and. The unexpected splash. Yeah, both of us did by accident. Thousands without power and more than 20 ferries canceled. Can you hear that? The storm rolling through BC's south coast. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. So parts of the province are in cleanup mode after a powerful historic storm hit overnight and earlier today. The unprecedented cyclone left thousands without power and travelers scrambling to rebook ferries. Lindsay Duncombe shows us the damage left behind both here and south of the border. The waves show the storm's power. British Columbians braced themselves against the apocalyptically named bomb cyclone. Trees crashed into homes. A branch came right through the roof of the sunroom, all this big around three to four inches, and landed right be more or less between my legs. Winds made it too dangerous for ferries to operate. This storm is particularly bad. We are seeing 11 routes affected up and down the coast, and uh, it is also persisting. Crews race to restore power to tens of thousands of customers. Storms this time of year are common on the West Coast, but a storm like this, it hasn't happened before, ever. This is the strongest low pressure system we've ever seen in the Pacific Northwest, that we've ever seen sitting off the coast of British Columbia. Here's how the system crashed into the coast, its southern tail bringing rain to California, an atmospheric river filling the streets. We've seen some pretty big storms and nothing like this at all. Okay, that's an eerie sound. On San Francisco's iconic Golden Gate Bridge, the wind created this strange whistle. What's happening is really a pylon of crises, with climate change making everything more intense. Forest fires and drought make trees dry and weak. Vulnerable branches break, roots give way, with catastrophic consequences, causing devastating landslides like this and highway closures. It's too dangerous to go in there right now. For some, the gusts are a call to adventure, a novelty for tourists. And got an unexpected splash. Yeah, both of us did by accident. Nature's beauty and danger on display. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. And we are just getting word that ferries are going to start running again at 7. Let's bring in meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. Joe, it's funny because not everyone really saw the extreme winds. I don't think I felt mm -hmm. anything, um, but this one is still really one for the history books. You're right. The center of this low, Anita, as you heard, uh, the deepest ever recorded off our coast. Really just coastal areas, though, seeing the brunt of these winds. And even then, it was a duration more than the speed. Take a look at the peak wind gusts across uh, just a sampling of the south coast. So we did hit that 100 kilometer per hour gust uh, down towards Race Rock. A lot of the usual suspects seeing those strongest wind gusts, YVR, 68 kilometers per hour, east side of the island, 70. So these uh, wind gusts alone, nothing to write home about. It was the duration for many of us, 36 hours of these kinds of wind gusts. I set the satellite back to Saturday when you can see that little eddy spinning off the jet stream turning into the most powerful system we've ever seen sitting off our west coast about 500 kilometers west of us here in vancouver if that storm had made landfall a very different story luckily that storm continues to spin offshore and weaken tonight we'll continue to see wind warnings drop although still in place in the yellow for parts of the island and the sunshine coast but metro vancouver no longer under the wind warning and we will continue to see those winds ease overnight and through Saturday, it's a breezy uh, Tuesday, I should say. Hopefully not right through till next Saturday because I've got a different story I want to tell you about uh, for next weekend, Anita. Okay, we'll chat soon, Joe. Thank you. You're welcome.
B.C. is ramping up its plan to fight climate change, and that means some more adjustments to how we live and how we spend our money. The new framework outlines measures for people and businesses through to the end of this decade. Bell Perry is here live, and Bell, take us through what's changing for us. Well, for starters, it will become more expensive to pollute. The government will move away from fossil fuels. It wants us to focus on alternate transportation, like walking, cycling, transit, instead of vehicle use. By the end of this decade, it hopes use of those other ways of getting around will increase by 30%. But clearly, it doesn't see vehicle use going away. Another target in the same plan is for 10,000 electric vehicle stations by 2030. As well, the government plans to accelerate zero emission vehicle laws. By 2030, 90% of passenger vehicles sold in BC will have to be zero emission. Now, BC already has the highest uptake per capita of the those types of cars and trucks in North America. Premier John Horgan says the past summer of wildfires and heat events and even today's wind and rain have been a stark indication of climate change. We have to have the same common purpose to attacking climate change that we have had to attacking COVID-19. This transcends political boundaries. It transcends regions of British Columbia. All of us working together with a singular focus on lifting up everyone. As we put a price on carbon pollution, we have to make sure that the low income and moderate income British Columbians do not suffer from that. But everything costs, and the one place consumers see that price tag is at the gas pump. Usually this is how it works. Every $5 increase in carbon tax adds a penny to a litre of gas. And the BC government says it plans to meet or exceed the federal government's benchmark for carbon penalties. Okay, ambitious targets for sure. How does the provincial government plan to achieve these targets? Well, it, it says uh, not much in the plan because there is quite a lack of information on how the targets will be met. Uh, that's one of the criticisms of the plan that we're hearing today. Another is that the province still heavily relies on fossil fuels and it's being criticized for continuing on the LNG Canada project, the natural, the liquefied natural gas facility in Kitimat. The Green Party of BC says if the government continues to subsidize fossil fuel production, meeting its targets will be hard. Even the support Orders who surrounded the Premier at his announcement say the roadmap sets the right course, but the clock is ticking. What matters is not what gets said today, but what gets done. And that's what will be judged by our peers, our kids, and their kids. So with 2030 approaching, as has been said, there's simply no time to waste, and the next six months are going to be crucial. So the plan certainly is somewhat short on detail, which has led some critics to say instead of a comprehensive map of climate action, the government has put forward an incomplete plan. Anita? Bell Perry live for us tonight. Thanks, Bill. And we are looking at a live shot of a climate protest outside YVR. Demonstrators slowing traffic and forcing drivers to divert. Now, there is a detour in place, but people are being taken away by police on stretchers. Uh, protesters are laying on the road, blocking the entire area, and police are having to load them up off the ground onto these stretchers to take them away. They're carrying signs that say we are on stolen Indigenous lands, hoping for better climate action. This is one protest, but there are several across the country, including Toronto, Nanaimo, and Victoria. Now, we are told the protesters plan to stay here for quite some time, but the police have read out uh, an injunction as well and are trying to get them to move. We are maximizing the disruption of the aviation industry as well as public disruption because we need to do both in order to actually bring the uh, obscenity of the climate emergency into the faces of the public. Extinction Rebellion protesters are also calling out what they say are lies from several levels of government that the emergency is actually being dealt with. That's the climate emergency. Demonstrators showed up tonight expecting to be arrested, saying that's what it takes to bring attention to their message. More than 20 arrests have been made during 10 consecutive days of activism. Well, for three days, a moored cargo ship has been burning near Victoria. Strong winds are making it hard for crews to knock the flames out. And Joel Ballard is hearing concerns both around the Coast Guard response and the impacts on the environment. You can't see the flames from above, but they're there. 
there are still pockets of flame and some ISO containers have internal fires. On Saturday, a container fire broke out on this shipping vessel. And as it has all weekend, the weather continues to create challenges. It's quite windy. The waves are also significant, which is preventing um, the ability of, this, of the, the salvers to transfer onto the ship. Legally in Canada, the owner of the vessel is responsible for salvaging efforts. But experts warn that might need to be rethought. I think we're relying too much upon the private sector, the polluter, to arrange the response when in fact it's Coast Guard that has to have the on the water capability. With no major spills recorded, Graham says we got lucky, but he worries that might not be the case in the future as tanker traffic in BC waters increases. We need better preparedness for actual spill response. Two of the burning containers on the vessel contained the mining compound potassium amyl xanthate. So one of the big challenges with potassium amyl xanthate is that on exposure to water, it has the potential to uh, react and form a flammable gas. So far, the province says there have been no environmental impacts from the fire, but it's not just the vessel that's causing concern. On Friday, the ship originally ran into trouble when 40 containers fell off. They're now drifting off the west coast of Vancouver Island, floating northwest. Inside two of those containers, that same chemical compound. And if they're damaged, it could spill out, potentially starting another fire. Other concerns with it are the chemical toxicity in and of itself. It's corrosive and an irritant. Um, and so if marine mammals were to come across it, then it could potentially have these effects. And keeping in mind that these mammals are immersed in the water, so anything they come in contact with comes in contact with their eyes, with their respiratory tract, with their entire body. An environmental unit has been established and the Coast Guard says the shipping company will attempt to retrieve the containers as soon as the winds calm. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Vancouver. New surveillance video is being shared tonight by police in hopes that it'll help find a man who they believe has been kidnapped. It all happened on a quiet street last month in Vancouver. Dan Burrett joins us live with more. Dan, this is a pretty strange case, so what do we know? Police say 33-year-old Jeffrey Lee was last seen by his girlfriend on September 23rd, leaving her apartment downtown to go gambling near Oak Ridge with some friends and associates. The VPD says this surveillance video shows Lee entering a high-rise near 41st on Elizabeth just east of Canby around 10.15 that night. He was then seen leaving that apartment just before 4 a.m. Police believe someone kidnapped him while he walked to his car. He was driving a black BMW X5. It was found the next day with the driver's side door still open. Police won't say if Lee was known to them or if someone has sent them a ransom note. They say they think they know what happened, but still they want more info. We believe that something bad has happened to Mr. Lee. He was kidnapped. Um, he was taken uh, from the street as he was getting into his car in the middle of the night. We believe that he was taken to um, an unknown location. And th all of those details suggest that something very bad has happened to Mr. Lee and we're very concerned. Jeffrey Lee was last seen wearing a dark Hugo Boss hoodie, black shorts, flip-flops, and a gray shoulder bag. He had short black hair and facial stubble at the time. Police say they don't know exactly why he was kidnapped, but anybody who's seen Jeffrey Lee knows where he is or has any information about this is asked to contact Vancouver Police. Anita? Dan, thank you. A father and son have been identified as the victims of a double homicide in Crofton, and charges have been laid in their deaths. 35-year-old Brad Johnson and his 57-year-old father, Tom Johnson, found dead at their home on Saturday just after midnight. Brad's childhood friend, Justin James Dodd, was arrested at the scene. It's alleged the accused needed a place to stay and was taken in by the Johnsons. He's been hit with two second-degree murder charges and is due to appear in court next week. With BC's vaccine card in place for more than a month, some restaurants say tensions have not eased. While many customers are respectful of the rules, businesses are still facing pushback from others. And as Benit Breach tells us, today is the day you now have to have two shots to get into many places in BC. This isn't the only thing shaking up this restaurant. BC's vaccine card is testing people's patience. They can be really aggressive and forward. 
not to mention the verbal abuse him and his employees have faced. At the end of the night, that's what you remember. They're usually the last guests coming in. They're always the most challenging. Um, and again, it's up to us to police it, which makes it even harder. While it's not happening every day, it's still unnerving. It's stressful. Um, you know, as the business owner, I just want to support my employees, and I know they're the ones having to deal with this. So far, VPD say they received no calls regarding vaccine card disputes. But in Vancouver, Corduroy Restaurant has been ordered to shut down. On the island, two warning letters have been sent to businesses regarding vaccine proof. In the interior, one restaurant has been shut down, and in Fraser Health... This restaurant in Hope has been ordered to shut down, but the biggest problem seem to be in Northern Health, where eight warnings have been handed out to businesses not asking for vaccine cards. But despite the problems, overall BC's vaccine card rollout has been smooth. Generally, like most everybody that we've talked to about it has been pretty understanding and um, compassionate. Um, we haven't really had any uh, major confrontations with people. And in larger spaces like this, it's been really positive. We're seeing um, a lot of guests coming into the venue, feeling really confident that they're protected in the space. Additional staff training is helping, she says. We have a supervisor at every point of entry that can assist with cases where maybe, um, you know, there, there's a little bit of a challenge. We're providing um, refunds to anyone who doesn't have the appropriate proof of vaccination. In order to have access to spaces like these, so far more than 3.6 million British Columbians have downloaded their vaccine cards. And now full vaccination is required. Beneath Breach, CBC News, Vancouver. To the provincial COVID picture now, where this weekend's numbers are roughly on par with recent trends. Still, a little more than 1,600 new cases recorded since Friday, a 12% drop compared to last weekend's figures. There are 20 new deaths to report spread across each health region and just under 5,000 active cases. The province also crossed a milestone this weekend. 90% of eligible adults have now had at least one vaccine dose. A woman fighting COVID-19 and in a medically induced coma at Royal Columbian Hospital has given birth. A baby was healthy. She's actually doing amazingly well for being how young she is and how, like how early the pregnancy was. She's just a miracle baby. There's nothing more I could say. She's just, she's met all the goals so far that the, uh, that they had in front of her. She's starting to feed now. Um, they have her off the breathing machine. And uh, so uh, she's, it's, it's just amazing how quick, babies recover and how they can surprise you. Crystal St. Pierre was just 27 weeks pregnant when she was put into that coma. The Fort St. John woman and her husband did not get vaccinated because they were worried about the impacts of vaccines. Doctors performed an emergency C-section because they wanted both mother and child to have a better chance of survival. Today is the last day British Columbians can give their thoughts on a proposed law that will set the province's policy on paid sick leave. The legislation is meant to come into effect in January, but right now it's not clear what the number of sick days a worker can take will be set at. But let's be clear, in the future, beyond COVID, if we can imagine that, when you have a flu uh, season, that's also extremely detrimental to folks in long-term care homes. We need to make sure workers have as the, as the seniors advocate has said, adequate sick days so that they have economic ability to stay home when they're not feeling well. The BC Federation of Labour protested outside the legislature this afternoon, demanding 10 days for all workers. It argues that one of the reasons for the COVID-19 outbreaks in long-term care homes was because of the lack of adequate paid sick leave and people coming into work because they needed to get paid. The Federation says 10-day option is in line with international standards. A suspected drug-impaired driver got a chilly reception from Victoria Police after crashing into an ice cream shop last night. Just before 11 p.m., officers responded to reports of a car smashing into the front of a stone-cold creamery near Douglas and Fort Street. Police used a stun gun to subdue and arrest the driver. The driver was believed to be drug-impaired and was sent to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. 
Well, have you ever tried Peking duck flavored Pringles or elderberry lemon Fanta? Well, these are just some of the treats you can find at two Vancouver businesses specializing in rare snacks. Although both were able to open and expand to second locations during the pandemic, as Ashley Mollier shows us, they weren't fully spared by the effects of COVID-19. My favorite Pringle are the Peking duck. These modern day bodegas are bringing rare snacks and drinks to Metro Vancouver. Lucky's Exotic Bodega and Dank Mart import their goods from regions of Europe, Asia and South America. Both businesses opened in 2020 in East and South Vancouver. Sales took off, with each store expanding to a second location. So I came here specifically for uh, like spooky treats. So I got some of these, uh, these Boo Oreos. Popcorn Kit Kat, never seen it. I also got some Skill Gummies. I'm TJ Voss, I'm one of the owners here at Lucky's Exotic Bodega. For us, the bodega, the, is, is a New York or a California term, and it's uh, supposed to be the place in the community where everyone congregates. Everyone comes, they come get their lottery tickets, they come get their you know, advice, they get their chopped cheese, they get their snacks, but it's that community feel, that community vibe where the owner knows all the kids by name as they grow up, and you know, that's what we wanted to emulate. We wanted to be somewhere where the community could be proud of us. With this whole trend of exotic snacks now booming and, and everyone wanting to be on it, we take pride in our curation of the items. We make sure that everything that comes in here is at a reasonable price. Just the other day, someone messaged me on Instagram and said, well, how much are the Pokemon Oreos that are gonna come be? I'm like, same price as all the other Oreos. But she's like, what everyone wants these. I'm like, I understand, but for me, it's the same. It should not be priced higher because everyone wants it. Myself grew up with a single mother, so for me to have prices that are very fair to everyone was very imperative. Importing these snacks has been challenging due to rising shipping costs. Before the pandemic, containers would cost anywhere between 1,000 to 1,500. Containers are now costing somewhere around 15,000 sometimes. A lot of people see it as a quick buck. If you're trying to look for a cash cow, this is not the one. This is a, a, a purely a labor of love. But Dankmar owner Spencer Sangera keeps his shop running in memory of his close friend and business partner. His partner was killed near Dankmart after it opened in 2020. Police have arrested a suspect in that case. We used to just be up all night snacking, like, you know, just trying everything from around the world. And it just, it, it was our passion. That's what really keeps me going every day when the days when I'm tired or, you know, like the days where I'm feeling a little down, missing my bro. I just think like, you know, how can we make him proud? Both businesses say they hope to open more stores in other Vancouver neighborhoods. Whether you come in here and spend a dollar or whether you come in here and don't spend anything, you're gonna get the same treatment. Without the customer, without the community support, we're nothing. And we're not here to take away from the community, but only to give back to the community. Ashley Moliere, CBC News, Vancouver. Some pretty cool treats. I have had a chance to check it out. Uh, you'll find some unique stuff for sure. Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC News at 6. I'm your host, Anita Bath. And if you're not already doing so, you can always find our program live on CBC Gem. That's our free app, but you can also watch us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. It's not the usual setting for nuptials. Why Vancouver General hosted a wedding this past weekend. That's next. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. An amateur astronomer in Nova Scotia is getting a rare distinction. As Colleen Jones tells us, he's just had an asteroid named after him. Look up, look way up. Somewhere far away in what's known as the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, you'll find David Chapman, the asteroid. I find the human David Chapman in his backyard in Dartmouth really uh, excited that I have a piece of celestial, you know, stuff that's got my name on it going around. As we tinker with his backyard telescope, you can't see David Chapman in space yet. He orbits the sun every 3.6 years. The human David Chapman hopes to be able to get a photograph of his asteroid soon. But I'm planning to take a picture of it next spring when it's in the morning sky. Uh, I'm going to try to take a picture of it with the robotic telescope at St. Mary's University. For the record, he's not the first Nova Scotian to have his name on an asteroid. There are six living Nova Scotians who have asteroids named after them. And then there's a, a few historical figures, two universities and one town. 
That town is Annapolis Royal, but still, this is rare. Of the 1.1 million asteroids floating around, only 23,000 have been named. David Chapman assures me his David Chapman is stable, not one of those rogue ones that might crash into Earth one day. Uh, some asteroids kind of go rogue, and you've heard about the Earth, you know, the near-Earth objects and the Earth crossing. You know, they're the ones that they're worried about, but David Chapman is not going to do that. It's in a very stable, very circular orbit, and it's very well behaved. Before it was named David Chapman, it was known as Asteroid 10047 after it was discovered at an observatory in Chile in 1986. The International Astronomical Union solicits recommendations of who should have the honor of having an asteroid named after them. And while Dave doesn't know who put his name forward, his longtime work with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada makes him a fine candidate. I mean, it was a shock, honestly, because like I wasn't expecting, I had no idea this was underway. When I think about it, I always end up saying, it's pretty cool that I have an asteroid named after me. Having your own asteroid? Well, it's certainly not something many of us will ever have. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Dartmouth. A special wedding ceremony at a venue like no other. Loved ones gathered at Vancouver General Hospital to see a couple tie the knot. As Janella Hamilton reports, a terminally ill man got his wish to marry his partner of more than 20 years. <laughs> well, me, it's beautiful. Meralda Reyes Ratana has been holding on to this wedding dress for 20 years. She bought it when her partner Doug Willoughby proposed. We are sort of kind of uh, soulmates. If I cry, I'm very sorry. It's an emotional day for the bride. After years of postponing their wedding due to evolving health issues, the couple finally says, I do. We used to buy the same book. In 2011, the couple's life was turned upside down when Doug started feeling pain in his gums. The surgeon came to me and said he has a brain infection. She was told bacteria had traveled to his brain. Shortly after, Doug fell into a coma that lasted for two and a half months, and it only got worse after that. About a year later, he had a stroke. And they say it was ALS, which is a, a fatal and irreversible disease. In the past few weeks, Doug lost the ability to eat on his own, and then doctors told Meralda her life partner was ready to die. I said, we haven't married yet. We said we were going to get married. And, um, and he looked at me. This kind of looks that only your partner can give you. And I knew that he was going to say yes. Doug decided to keep living, at least for a little longer, so she and her family got to work planning a wedding in just a week. The wedding took place Sunday in the chapel at Vancouver General Hospital, surrounded by a small group of friends and family. They've just overcome so many obstacles together. Meralda was most looking forward to that feeling of seeing Doug as she walked down the aisle. We're going to be the same excited two young people that we were 20 years ago, because our love, it doesn't age, it doesn't die. She says doctors believe Doug has no more than two months to live. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver.
Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe is touting the province's success in boosting vaccinations and driving cases down. But as Omira Issat tells us, some fear optimism without more action is giving the virus opportunity to spread. For many fighting to keep COVID patients alive in Saskatchewan's overcrowded ICUs, something needs to change. But Premier Scott Moe insists existing policies are working. Our trajectory is improving and it's improving greatly. Moe insists more restrictions are both unnecessary and unfair. It doesn't make sense to restrict everyone's activities and take away ultimately their personal freedoms. The rate of new cases is falling, but Saskatchewan's ICUs are still in the worst wave of the pandemic. The number falling now mainly because several patients have been sent out of province to Ontario. Saskatchewan is, is in a crisis. Healthcare system is collapsing around us, and we do need to have public health measures put into place. Public health experts, including the province's own chief medical health officer, are calling for gathering limits. You know, unless we put those restrictions in place, like this is just going to keep dragging on and on and on and get progressively worse and worse. It's very frustrating. The mayor of Saskatoon says more needs to be done. His city is planning on taking matters into its own hands and imposing gathering restrictions. Given the urgency and the extraordinary nature of the situation, our citizens want us to do everything we can right now to help to and make sure that our health care system can function and to prevent loss of life. Despite it all, some glimmers of hope. By the end of Wednesday, a total of 19 ICU patients will have been transferred to Ontario. Up to six critical military nurses are being deployed to Saskatchewan. Premier Scott Moe says he is optimistic about the future of the province. But the worry on the front lines of the pandemic is that things will in fact take a turn for the worst. Omer Issa, CBC News, Regina. Moderna says a low dose of its COVID-19 vaccine is safe and appears to work for kids 6 to 11 years old. The company is the latest vaccine maker to propose expanding its shots to children under 12. The study involved more than 4,700 children who were given two shots one month apart. Each shot contained half the dose meant for adults. Early results showed those kids developed similar levels of virus-fighting antibodies as young adults receiving full-strength shots. The number of participants is considered too small to look for potential side effects. Moderna says studies are ongoing to figure out the vaccine's effectiveness in preventing COVID-19 among children. It's an ambitious policy, an attempt to drastically reduce BC's carbon footprint. So how will the program work? Well, we speak to one of the province's advisors next. And finally, 25 years ago today, demonstrations in Budapest began a nationwide rebellion in Hungary. The Soviet Union crushed it with a full-scale invasion. Thousands died in the fighting, and hundreds of thousands fled, many of them to Canada. In tonight's special report, Sheldon Turcott looks back on those turbulent times. It started out as a peaceful demonstration by university students. In a spontaneous outburst, it released pent-up frustration and smoldering resentment of tyranny. The students were joined by the masses, even the army. Every emblem of Soviet domination was ripped down. The goal was to exterminate the Stalinist secret police and expel the hated Russian occupiers. At first, it appeared the Hungarians would win their freedom, but the joy was brief. 200,000 Soviet soldiers in armored vehicles crossed the border and surrounded Budapest. On November the 4th, they attacked. Resistance was stiff, Russian losses were heavy, but the small arms and Molotov cocktails were no match for tanks. At least 25,000 Hungarians were killed. In six days, the revolt was crushed, and 200,000 people fled the country. 38,000 of them came to Canada, the most admitted by any nation in the world. These refugees were in shock at first, a new land, a strange culture, little money, the language barrier. 25 years later, there are only a few small signs of the Hungarian community in Canada. Most of the newcomers, 
plunged into the Canadian mainstream and have done phenomenally well. Frank Felkai is a successful Toronto lawyer who has twice run for political office in Canada, something he could only dream about as a teenager when he took part in that fateful demonstration on October 23, 1956. We found what we were looking for. We found freedom of expression, a free country, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, and we're grateful we found the chance to compete and to succeed. Yes, the country kept its promise. We hope we kept ours. The University of British Columbia picked up the entire faculty and student body of a forestry school in Hungary, 196 of them. They helped raise forestry to a science, not just cutting down trees, but farming the forests as a renewable crop. So to be able to make more high Engineer John Gary is standing tall these days as a builder in Toronto. He's made it now, but it was frustrating at first. The only problem was to learn the language, because it's very hard to sit in an engineering office know what you need to do, but unable to express yourself. Uh, the difficulty was to learn inches, pounds, and all these measurements. And now I have a hell of a problem to learn again the centimeters. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We don't know exactly why he was kidnapped, but we know there are people out there who do have information about what happened, and we're asking those people to come forward. Vancouver police are looking into an alleged kidnapping. This is video of the victim. It's believed 33-year-old Jeffrey Lee was abducted by force and taken to an unknown location in the early hours of September 24th near Oak Ridge Mall. Investigators say they know people have information and are asking them to come forward. Can you hear that? A historic storm has created powerful winds on Vancouver Island and BC's south coast. Thousands were left without power and more than 20 ferry sailings were cancelled. Ferries are coming back this evening though. A rare weather bomb hundreds of kilometres off our coast was caused by a rapidly deepening low pressure system. This transcends political boundaries, it transcends regions of British Columbia, all of us working together with a singular focus on lifting up everyone. As we put a price on carbon pollution, we have to make sure that the low-income and moderate-income British Columbians do not suffer from that. BC has a new climate plan to help reach the province's goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. It includes 10,000 public electric vehicle charging station and the electrification of public transit and ferries. So how good and how realistic are BC's emissions targets? I want to bring in SFU sustainable energy professor Mark Jackard now. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Mark, you advised on this Clean BC strategy. We've heard and talked about so-called targets for years now. So what is different about these ones in terms of actually being realistic? I do have some expertise in this area and have worked on this for a, a few decades. And um, we tend to say that you can tell how sincere politicians are on actually hitting their targets if, they, if their plan includes a rising carbon price, well, the, the carbon tax we have in British Columbia, and a tightening of the regulations that, um, for example, control the sales of gasoline versus electric cars or regulations on electricity or on buildings. And so uh, this particular plan of the BC government emphasizes the, the pricing and the regulations. And then, of course, you need to support people in the transition, and it has that as well. I would say it's not often that governments are praised for their climate plans. Um, so what are the key points in this one that really stand out to you um, that make it good? I know you talked about carbon pricing, but what else? Yeah, so a uh, good point you just made, though. It's very rare that I praise governments for their climate plans, and that's sad, but that's that's been the reality. You, you really, you don't reduce emissions if you don't make it 
more expensive or more difficult to burn gasoline in your car, diesel in your truck, natural gas in your home, and for industry to be using coal or oil or natural gas. Um, but there's a lot of regulations in there uh, of the good kind. I call them flexible or smart regulations. They don't force everyone to do everything. And I'll just give you an example, which is the zero emission vehicle mandate. But we said, oh, well, by 2030, we're going to force sellers of cars to make sure that 30% of the market is zero emission. This new plan says, sorry, make that 95%. Now, remember, that still means that uh, or 90%. It still means that people in northern communities might still want to get a truck or, you know, that doesn't, um, that still uses gasoline. So that's a certain percentage. Also, there are plug in hybrid vehicles included in that. So, and yet, you know, in areas where it's possible, uh, milder climates like Victoria and Vancouver, you're going to see you know, almost everyone driving an electric vehicle, and many of us are already, and it's a very easy thing to do. It doesn't change your lifestyle. The, the plan is very aggressive on this zero emission vehicle mandate. It makes us among the world leaders. And what does this plan mean for British Columbians in terms of how it impacts my wallet? Yeah, so, so first of all, it won't affect your lifestyle at all. Uh, I and friends who are zero emission just have uh, an electric car and a different heating system, and you wouldn't really know. You just go and put the thermostat up or down. There's, there's no change. What's the cost to this? Well, as we do this over the next two, four, 10 years, um, in some cases, especially for wealthier British, the really wealthy British Columbians, the sort of average cost of energy will go up a bit. But the government has a bunch of programs in here that are going to make sure that for middle class and lower, lower income people, and also for people in remote or rural areas or indigenous peoples, there will be support programs in place so that the bottom line for them economically uh, shouldn't be much different. It would be really hard to notice that difference, to, as I say, two, six, eight, ten years from now. This plan, of course, comes just before the climate conference in Glasgow, COP26. I'm sure we'll be talking to you more in the coming weeks about that. Thank you, Mark Jackard. Thank you. Climate change is a very big problem that can seem daunting at an individual level. Coming up, how one grassroots organization is trying to change that. And at 641, you're looking at a live shot of very stormy Tofino, maybe the best place to watch a storm. Good weather to sit back and enjoy the view. Johanna looks ahead at the weather for the week ahead. That's next. An angel he came and painted the sky. All the little girls cheered as the boys wiped their eyes. Ooh, hurry faster. What about that heart beat? My name is Valmy and I'm a singer-songwriter. So I grew up in Ontario um, and then I moved to Nova Scotia in 2016 for school. So I lived there for a little over three years and then I moved to Newfoundland um, to do an internship position. When we drove down to the harbor, topped for the whole ride. Music is important to me, definitely. Uh, I've been interested in music from a very young age. Like I've always been singing and always interested in playing instruments. And so growing up, I played a little bit of piano and then I self-taught in guitar. And so when I went to university for music therapy, I had piano as my primary instrument. Um, and in the mix of that, I also started getting more into songwriting and sort of just being part of music in those different capacities. Tired of interest on And I wanted to ask him what brought him there alone. Ooh, cause I clear in your own head. Too much for your own bed or your close friends. It's a feeling I know. 
I don't know if there's ever really a point where I made a decision that I was going to go the singer-songwriter route. I think that I was just involved in, mu in music in capacity ways and really loved to sing that at one point I thought, oh, I could, I could start trying to write songs. And I found it as a really helpful outlet for if I was going through a rough time and writing things and if I was listening to sad music and I'd be like, well, that made me feel better listening to that. And maybe I could write my feelings out and see how I like that. And there's definitely times with the beating where I didn't like what I was doing because I was like, oh, this kind of sucks, but it was nice to write it. Um, and I kind of noticed that I was getting better at it. And I think that it started to affect the way I was listening to the artists um, that I liked as well. Kind of saying, like, how are they using phrasing and melodies? Or what are they talking about? And how are they talking about it? Are they being really literal? Is it more symbolic? What, what am I connecting to in this that I can kind of make my own and my own stuff as well and so I think just from writing music to process my own feelings it kind of just developed in that way and then I realized oh this is something I'm doing and I was meeting other people who were doing it too and like collaborating with them it's like well this is this is fun so I think it kind of happened organically I could hear that heart beat. Well, it's a stark outcome that the developed world has failed to deliver on its commitments to help poorer countries fight the effects of climate change. That's according to a report jointly drafted by Canada and Germany ahead of the UN climate conference in Glasgow, COP26. Rafi Bujikanian breaks down what is being called an erosion of trust. For many parts of the world, catastrophic impacts from climate change aren't a warning for the future. They're happening right now. We're beyond um, urgency. It's, it's, it's beyond all of the big words that you can use. Um, code red, emergency. For islanders, it is very, very real. On Australia's northeast, some of the 36 atolls and islands comprising the Marshall Islands are expected to be submerged in just 14 years. We really need to see that countries stand in solidarity with those of us on the front lines of this crisis. It's also not entirely a new alarm bell. The Maldives held an underwater cabinet meeting in 2009 just to drive the point home. That same year, the world's wealthier countries pledged to raise $100 billion a year toward climate financing set to start in 2020. But the OECD has admitted the goal would likely not be met. There certainly was disappointment. There probably still is some disappointment. And ahead of the COP26 climate conference, host country, the United Kingdom, has asked Canada and Germany to make sure developed countries can reach the target in 2023. What folks had actually committed to. And what we have done through the course of this exercise is raise the level of ambition from public finance uh, going forward without making more aggressive assumptions around private sector mobilization. While environmental groups say even meeting the goal is too modest an objective. India announced its climate action plan, or NDCs as we call it. The figure that it quoted in its plan was $2.5 trillion are required by 2030. The report, prepared by Canada and Germany ahead of the COP26 summit, recommends developed nations discuss realistic ways to figure out how to meet their commitment. Prime Minister Trudeau will be there for some of that, attending two days of the summit that kicks off on October 31st. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Let's bring in meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. And Joe, you are heading to that conference in Glasgow. That's right, Anita. I'll be there for the second week on the ground. It'll be my uh, third climate change conference. And this really is the make it or break it one to ratify our Paris Agreement. And uh, Anita, you and I will be uh, checking in each night uh, for that second week. I'll keep you posted. Breaking down the science behind the headlines. And uh, indeed, today was one of those days, uh, climate change fingerprint all over our supercharged storm just off the coast of Vancouver Island. It is weakening though. Let me take you to the big picture as this low pressure system spins out, leaving behind just gusty winds tonight. We still have wind warnings in place for the Sunshine Coast and the island, but those will taper through the overnight as the storm really dissipates out. Have to leave the risk for some lingering showers in. Here's Tuesday running you through the day. The coast still looking pretty soggy, 
Uh, we still are looking to get another general 10 to 20 millimeters for Metro Vancouver, and we'll see snow levels drop. So uh, we could see some snow for our local mountains over the next 24 hours. Uh, it's going to translate to just a few afternoon showers for the interior. Uh, it was mainly gray day for places like Kelowna and Williams Lake. Cranbrook looking at sunshine for tomorrow. And I think everyone should see a hint of sunshine uh, Wednesday, looking much, much sunnier for the interior. It's going to take a couple more days for things to clear out along the coast. Uh, we've got a uh, pretty wet next couple of days. It'll be a dramatic afternoon forecast. Uh, showers to start, uh, but then as we get into the afternoon, some of those dark clouds and swirling winds get your cameras ready. It's only 10 degrees tomorrow. We'll see temperatures rebound to seasonal for Wednesday. Lingering showers through Wednesday and Thursday. I've, I've heard many of you say, uh, it would be nice to have a break from the rain, even though we're still trying to uh, replenish the ground from our summer uh, drought conditions. We are well above our seasonal for October rainfall, and it looks like we'll get that break as we head into Friday and Saturday. In fact, looking at some uh, long range models, we need a Saturday night into Sunday. We could be hitting the freezing mark for the first time in a little while. So I'll keep you posted. Lots to look out for in the app. Uh, OK, I was going to say, I don't mind the rain. It's good. And then you hit me with the freezing. Not I tried to sneak it. that in without you listening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and back to COP26 in Glasgow. I know you've been following a local climate story. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, Anita, as all these world leaders meet uh, in Glasgow, basically to work out the you know top-down, big-picture solutions, researchers and neighbours in our own Vancouver are trying to tackle the problem of climate change in their own backyard. Take a look. This Vancouver neighborhood is taking charge of climate change in their own backyard, block by city block. Through this workshop series, we will guide participants through identifying what climate change means to their neighborhood and then turning that into their own visions of what their neighborhood can look like if it's more climate friendly. So let's begin. Cheryl Ng is the leader of a University of British Columbia initiative that asks people to first consider climate change by simply walking their local streets. And if you can get tape measures from me, that will be great. And taking a closer look. We want you to count the trees very quickly. It's not very super scientific, it's just a rough estimate. Are the rooftops dark, absorbing hot sun? Or are they a space for plants to grow? Is there greenery on the ground? Or is it blacktop as far as the eye can see? Can you see, hear, notice anything that emits carbon. Is the goal is to engage everyday people in achievable change that's rooted right in their own communities. We wanted to turn all this negativity into positivity instead. And we thought, well, what better way to start than to just, you know, go to people right where they live. Sherling hopes these workshops will teach people to see climate change solutions in their daily lives. Hello. Hi, Rory. Hi, come on in. Oh, thank you very much. Welcome. Rory Filer is in this workshop. And after last summer's heat dome, he started thinking about what he could do about climate change, an idea that literally started as a seed. I'm 32nd here. It's full of trees, full of chestnuts and acorn uh, oak trees. So uh, I had the idea to pick up some of those chestnuts and acorns and try to sprout some trees out of them. Six sprouts later, minus lunch for a few squirrels, one growing chestnut tree remains. Rory is hoping his future tree will not only help provide shade for the increasingly hot days, but help to pull out and store carbon from the atmosphere. Well, I have two girls uh, and they're pretty young and uh, I want to make sure that there's, there's not, that the, the effects of climate change are minimal for them and for their children. Planting a tree here and a tree there might seem modest, but researchers say if Canada is going to achieve its Paris climate goals, that's reducing emissions 30% by 2030, some of it is going to have to come from suburban neighbourhoods, like this one. Half of the country's residential blocks will have to be carbon neutral in nine short years. We do have to find ways to make that connection to just local people, ordinary folk, you know, they're trying to figure out what to do, and there is this enormous anxiety about all the doom and gloom and it's depressing what the impacts might be if we don't make these changes. For Stephen Shepard, thinking about how to close this gap has been his life's work. Five years ago, he started the Cool Kits project in Vancouver, which has now evolved into the current walking workshops. What are you going to do about climate change? You can 
deny it's happening, you can be very worried about it, or you can actually do something about it, especially if it's fun and positive and makes a difference, and make something visible on the ground. And it's catching on. He's now working with groups in places like Mississauga and Vancouver Island. This template can be adapted to work anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. You can picture it if you try. A few solar panels here, a garden box there, a few extra trees. This is the stuff inspiring neighbors who've never thought of themselves as climate change trailblazers until now. Encouraging my community, my neighborhood to take on initiatives, maybe they're simple at first, a community garden, to more elaborate, like looking at bike routes within our neighborhood. So while the world meets in Glasgow, this community and the research team urging them on will be working toward a change they're invested in. I'm hoping to act on climate change as soon as possible and make a better future. A brighter future built neighborhood by neighborhood. Johanna Wagstaff, CBC News, Vancouver. Ups all freed over the weekend. Their delicate journey and a difficult one to freedom is next. For Tiara J. Chutkan, rediscovering her Caribbean roots came at a time when she was rediscovering herself. I think I felt really out of place. This was a couple years ago for me, so I was um, I was like 22, and I felt I was just in this very strange place in my life where I didn't really know where I was going. It was really overwhelming, and it was kind of like tricky because I just felt like I didn't know myself enough. Chetkan has Trinidadian and Guyanese roots, but growing up, she never really paid attention to what her cultural identity meant to her. But she did know when people were quick to assume she was of South Asian descent, something she never really understood. When people think the Caribbean, I feel like the, they think of like the more common islands, like Jamaica, for example. But Trinidad and Guyana, no one really identified. And then after that, it was, you know, followed up by, well, why do you look Indian then? Like as, it, as in from India. And that was weird for me too because I never thought about it that way. My identity always felt very invalidated. A new CBC series called Rediscovering Culture is asking people in the GTA what it's like for them to be reconnecting with their cultural roots. For some, the journey might be similar to that of Tiara, a disconnect from what the world sees versus what they know about themselves. For those like Ravina Chan Jussel, the journey towards reconnecting to culture has come from a place of finding belonging after being around friends who, she says, stifled her from being her authentic self. Everything that mattered to them was about being being brown on their terms. That meant like talking about Bollywood, but not too much. It meant bringing Indian food, but not the gross kind. I would say like, oh guys, like, you know, let's do something for the Bali or like, let's play holy or they're like, no, we're not Bob. She says going to university in London, Ontario really made a difference for her. I found my friends who happened to be Indian because I just naturally wanted people who like Indian culture and that naturally meant like following cultural things and doing cultural things like going to Garba and going to you know the dance um, workshops that we had like for Pongra and stuff like that so and that was because I felt accepted finally but not only because I was around people that accepted me but I think it's because I finally just accepted who I was. There is something missing for this second generation of millennials and now generation Z who are coming up, who are still looking for this meaning. Camille Hernandez Ramdwar is a professor in the Department of Sociology and Caribbean Studies at Ryerson University. She says while anyone at any stage in life can be on this journey, there is a sense of wonder, especially in younger generations. It's feeling like being Canadian isn't enough because this generation is still being asked the same questions my generation was, which is where are you from? The two-year journey towards rediscovery has been eye-opening for Chet Kan. People of color, whatever background, have not always been able to see themselves and, and express their culture and feel comfortable in spaces and feel represented.
Well, they may not be household names, but queso, gila, souffle, noodles, and quick step are free. I love that. The five harbor seal pups from Vancouver Aquarium were returned to the wild yesterday afternoon. They are among 80 seal pups that had been taken in for rehabilitation earlier this year. These five particular pups, they were uh, healthy, deemed healthy by our staff veterinarian, and uh, they had bulked up their weight to, uh, to a good healthy release weight, had lots of blubber built up, and uh, and they were ready to go. Yeah, they were healthy and, and ready to go back to the wild. So that's why they were released yesterday. The seals were released by aquarium staff at Crescent Beach. Now, it took the pups some time to figure out where they were, but once they were in the water, they figured it out pretty quickly. Hope to see the rest of them returned as well. Great work the aquarium is doing. You can always find our news program online at cbc.ca slash bc. And Dan Bird is here at 11 o'clock tonight after the National. Have a good night.